Welcome to this series of interviews with remaining Chisnell Studios founding members. These interviews will form an audio archive illuminating the Chisnell Art Places archive of photographs and is part of our commemoration of the 40 year anniversary of Chisnell Art Place. In October 1980, a group of artists were granted guardianship of a derelict industrial building in Bow, East London, by the London Bar Borough of Tower Hamlets. In return for use of the building and cheap rent, the artists were charged with the repair of the building in order to create affordable individual artist studios, a dance space, gallery, and an educational program for the local community. The image on screen depicts those very early days in 1980, shortly after work had begun. This interview is with the interdisciplinary artist and founding member Ingrid Kerman. The image on screen is entitled Mountain Lake, and it's a painting measuring 130 centimetres by 140 centimetres, made in 2008. Ingrid Kerma was born in Elberswald, near Berlin in Germany. She studied fine art at Reading University and took her MA at Goldsmiths College in London. She lives and works in both London and Berlin. She has exhibited extensively in Britain and Germany and throughout Europe and the USA. Her work can be found in many collections in Europe and America, as well as in corporate collections such as The Economist London. The image on screen is a work entitled Elsa, a body cast and accompanying video work whose subject is the artist's mother, made when she was 93 years old. Ingrid has very kindly selected three images from the Chisholm archive to discuss her memories of the early days of Chisholm Hill Art Place. The first of which is an image of two artists and founding members, Richard Wilson and Candy Kemp, lifting breeze blocks onto the building roof. It must have been a mammoth undertaking making the building watertight and then building individual spaces for artists. Perhaps you could shed some light on how long this took and how it was organized, Ingrid. I can't actually remember how long it took, but it 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 was done in stages. Uh, first of all, we had to, uh, of course, uh, put the uh, glass into the windows, which were all smashed, and we um, we found a whole uh, a whole lorry load almost of glass that had black marks on it, which uh which was donated to us and which we used to use for the windows that were smashed. We also had to um make sure that we had enough breeze blocks to build the walls. We couldn't build the walls out of just studying and and plasterboard because it wouldn't have been solid enough. So we had to um use breeze blocks. And this is a picture of the breeze blocks arriving at the top of the building with a kind of pulley, serve, a pulley uh, lift. And then there was a row of people and the breeze blocks were passed from one person to another. And those pieces of glass that you mentioned, um, I've heard other founding members uh, mention them as well. And those, some of those panes of glass are actually still in the building. Uh, some are still in the building, yes. A lot of, and I mean, we couldn't get rid of the black markings because they were actually pictures. And we learned how to cut the glass and how to get the glass out of the out of the the broken glass out of the existing windows, and then putty in these kind of thick panes of glass. And those original panes are they the ones that have the very fine black lines on them in some of the studios? The ones we um, we got donated, yes, we actually yes, and we yeah. had this. I mean, Nigel men mentioned that we had this kind of red former post office lorry, uh, and anything we could transport ourselves and didn't cost any money for the transport, we uh, transported ourselves, including that lot of glass. <laughs> 
And how are you getting the bricks up onto the roof in this image? Well, there was this kind of, I don't know what it's called, you know, it, it is uh, a pulley that, um, where you loaded the bricks on and the pulley, and then, then you had to sort of make sure it goes up. And at the top, um, people actually had to, and you can see Richard Wilson uh, taking the bricks off the, that pulley over the wall and and onto that roof. And those would be the bricks for the third floor or, uh, yeah, I guess. I think there were the bricks for all the floors because it was easier to get, a big, you couldn't, the windows weren't big enough for the bricks to come into the windows. So the bricks were all put on the top floor and it was easier to carry the bricks down than to carry them up three floors. And when I spoke to Nigel, he mentioned um, it being quite medieval in some respects, because I, I believe uh, this machine that was used to carry the bricks up to the roof, that was um, something that came a bit later on. And initially, it was like a chain gang where, where people were... That's you know, right. Yes. And th that kind of chain gang also moved the bricks uh, physically from one person to the next up to the first floor. and some to the second floor. Moving on to the second image that you've selected, Ingrid. It's a grainy black and white image of a very dark and industrial space filled with large wooden or wicker frame sculptural works accompanied by a series of paintings or charcoal drawings. Was this your original studio, Ingrid? No, it was the gallery space. The gallery, when we got the building, the ground floor um, had a lot of stuff in it, including a huge pile of burned uh, shoes for some reason. And that the blackened ceiling and the walls and the floor was the leftover once the shoes were cleared. That was the gallery space before it was done up. And the wicker work kind of wooden, I call it wicker work, uh, tools um, I made during one winter in my studio on the uh, second floor. Uh, is it the second floor or the third floor? The, uh, I mean, it's the second floor um, because we then never had uh, heating in the winter. We still don't have heating and it gets very, very cold. In order to keep warm, I'm a painter. I had never made sculpture, but I thought uh, to keep warm, I just hacked a lot of wood into thin pieces and tied them together and made these wicker work um, tools, pincers, hammers, and a pickaxe just for fun. And in order to photograph them, my studio was a large studio, but not big enough to stand back to make a photograph like that. So I, I photographed them in the, in the what was then um, that empty space. And did you make this work after the building work had completed or while it was still going on? I'm just curious about your your choice of uh, subject matter for these sculptural works, which were two. Well, it was just completed. I I um, I don't know how I came to be pa painting. I made a lot of painting out of uh, from um, depicting tools, and then I made these because. Um, these sculptures, I just made huge ones. I, I also made huge paintings. And that is why I needed a big studio because <laughs> I made it the, made the paintings big enough to just pass through uh, diagonally through the door, through my door of the studio. But these um, sculptures were done uh, just after the studio spaces had been completed. And you mean the, this is in the gallery space this image was taken? So it, you mean, was the space just kind of, was that one of the last places to be kind of built or cleaned up or, and also... It was, 
was it like a bookable space? Did you just, was it still derelict and you just decided to go down there with your work and, and set up this, this image? It was still derelict, but it was sort of cleaned up. In fact, um, there were two or three people. I mean, there was Hannah Collins who had um, um, a fluorescent piece in the uh, um, in that space while it was in that state. And Richard Wilson made a kind of huge industrial piece that included um, a kind of diagonally, uh, almost like a water wheel, something like that. I can't quite remember it. I don't think there is an image of it. And was that just an impromptu group show or were you just all using the space to try out kind of large and more ambitious works? It was completely impromptu. Um, anybody could have used the space. And so the, the view of the gallery space, uh, I'm just trying to orientate myself. So am I, am I standing, if I'm standing in the present gallery and I'm looking towards uh, Peter Ashkew's studio, is that the view? The other way, it's the other way around. You're standing near Peter Askew's studio looking at the end of the gallery wall and the windows to the canal are on the right-hand side. Do I, am I right in thinking that um, obviously you were making these sculptural works as a, as a means to try and keep warm in, in, in a very cold building, but I seem to remember that were these pieces actually coated in, in, in soot of some kind? I mean, did that so come oh, yes. That's right, because the wood, of course, was um, usually it was left over two by ones or four by four um, or two by four, two by two pieces of wood, any length. And um, it was it was wood colored. And then um, I don't know why I blackened it to make it fit into the into the ground floor blackened space. It's a kind of history of. Um, how we how we found the place and dealt with it and and the tools were tools were the most important kind of um, objects at the time for us because we had to we had to use the tools to to um, to build the, it's not just the walls, but we had to make the doors. We had to measure the, the doors. We had to put the windows in. We had to put um, water in on on each floor, um, things like that. And you mean yourself and Nigel have both mentioned this huge pile of shoes. What, what became of those shoes? Um, I was wondering if the soot, because you said some of them were burnt, if they had been, if you'd used some of that soot yourself in these sculptural works. Well, the, the, obviously we had one skip after another to clear the space. There were also huge oil um, containers um, on the ground floor and on the wharf to hold oil. Now, Unfortunately, um, that oil, somebody opened the tap and the oil spilled into the canal, um, which was during May. And of course, all the fishermen were really angry and the canal was for miles and miles, had this oil slick on top. Um, but then we, we were left with the with the containers. So the containers were cut up and um, we, I think we sold the, uh, the metal to scrap metal dealer, dealers. And how, like, I'm just, I'd never heard that um, story about the canal getting covered in oil. How did that get cleaned up in the end? Was that? The council, the council did that. The council did that with kind of, um, straw material or matting thing with something like that. They soaked up the the oil and put it on barges. Put this matting that was soaked in oil on onto barges, and then got rid of it. I don't know how, but it went all the way. Um, 
almost up to the Thames. I mean, it was just horrendous. And was I, was there any, I'm sure the council wasn't too happy about that happening. And was there any, um, did they get in touch with you with the artists and kind of? They obviously wanted to know what happened there, but um, there were always um, youngsters, I mean, not children, but sort of teenagers, older teenagers that came over from the park side on the, they, they, they use kind of any any foam or any kind of surface where they could stand on and 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 came over onto our wharf side and it could have been them. It was never cleared up. Should we move on to the next image? Ingrid? Yes, please. The third image you selected, Ingrid, is of an installation in a bright white traditional white cube gallery space. There is a mixture of sculptural works and paintings. Uh, I assume this was a group show in Grid. Yes, it was uh, one of the first group shows after the gallery uh, was cleared up. It is the same space as the blackened one you saw just now. Um, it was painted. It was, um, I mean, you don't recognize it. And in those days, in, in the mid 1980s, uh, you didn't have these huge white spaces as gallery spaces. That, that, you know, a gallery space was a much smaller space. The work was much smaller generally, you know, when it was a traditional gallery space. But we wanted, we saw this space straight away as a gallery space. And now Chisenhale Gallery is internationally known, but that is a long time off after um, it became an independent gallery. And how did this particular exhibition come about? Was it a group show of um, studio it was a group, It was a group show that um, David Thorpe had organised, and David Thorpe was one of the uh, gallery managers at the time. He was also... Um, our studio manager, the studio manager, the gallery manager was always, not always, was in those days, one and the same person. And David Thorpe, after, um, after he was at Chisenhall for a few years, then went to the South London Gallery to manage that. And your work in this exhibition, if I'm right in thinking, is the, um, the large vertical, uh, it looks like a diptych perhaps on the right hand side. It is a diptych, yes. In those days, I painted still a lot of black stuff, but it was mixed uh, oil paint uh, and wax encaustic, actually, was thick, thick stuff on canvas. And the canvas was stretched on, um, on wooden stretchers. And they were straight. The stretches were straight. It just is this optical illusion that it it has this totem pole quality. When we spoke earlier on, prior to this uh, this interview, we were actually discussing this image. There's a piece of work to the left hand side of yours, which has two panels on it and both say pain. And I believe that's the work of Pete Lloyd Lewis. Is that correct? That is correct. That's Pete Lloyd Lewis. Pete. Uh, was one of the founder members, and I was surprised when I saw that image that even in those days he used words on his uh, canvas. Later he used glitter and words, but I think in those days it was a plain background. Uh, Pete was very, very much involved in uh, Chisenhale in the building work, but also later, once the gallery was done, he was always um, working with the gallery manager as a sort of gallery assistant. And the reason why I'm interested in, in specifically in, in Pete Lloyd Lewis is because that's how I um, came to be in the studios myself. Um, myself and Fritha Jenkins uh, were very uh, lucky enough to be awarded a studio residency in, in Pete's old studio for a couple of years. I'm curious to know a bit about uh, Pete's history with, with the Chisholm Art Place and his involvement in, in the early days, because he's sadly no longer with us. Yes, that that is sad. And um, 
I was very glad that that his studio became one of the kind of studios uh, where up and coming artists could work without paying rent. It was a supported studio. And even to this day, there's some of his work dotted around studios. There's um, a piece of his work outside Studio 3, I believe. And also there are quite a lot of uh, doormats dotted around the studios with with words. Oh my God! (laughs) Yes! I even, he gave away the doormats. I remember that. And I still have uh, one of the doormats, in fact, in this very room. (laughs) <laughs> I've always been very envious of that work because, um, yeah, I, that's. I should I should really not use it as a doormat, but frame it and put it on the wall. It says angst. Yeah, I think I've heard. Though I haven't seen those ones myself, but I, I have heard that angst. I believe angst was quite a popular one that um, that he had made. Yes, it was danger, angst, and then he also made these kind of lightweight foam. He had them made squares. One I unfortunately had to get rid of and one I still have and use it all the time. So Ingrid, are you still in your original studio um, from the early days of Chisholm Hill? I am, but a third of, I still in the original studio, but the third of the studio, I had a studio, I I was greedy. I wanted the larger studio. I mean, we could, we had the choice. We we actually had surplus space. So um, I wanted a studio with three windows. So I had a studio with three windows. Um, but then I shared my studio. Oh, one of, I did share my studio with uh, Matthew Collings and he, wa- he built a wall between uh, one of the windows and my space and um, in, in, in studying. So um, my studio now is a third smaller than it used to be. But I then, once he left, I then sublet that third part to two other artists. Um, and now the third part has become a completely independent studio, 17B. Now it's 17A and 17B, but all the electrical connections are in the third part of the studio. I haven't got any plugs or anything. <laughs> So I imagine that 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 uh, third has its own door now um, for the as a studio itself. So it's a completely independent studio space. So how do you manage to get electricity from that space into yours? Well, I don't even want to get into it, but we did a lot of things ourselves. So I had wiring. Um, I don't know where that wiring came from. There, there was a kind of junction box, and I took the wiring from there, and it's still almost free floating now. I mean, I know it shouldn't be, but it is. And I have two. I have a socket with two two plugs where I can do everything from. But I mean, there is so much stuff in the history of of Chisholm Hale. This kind of painting with encaustic. I had to actually melt the wax on an open fire. And I once caused a fire through that. I, I was aware of that, Ingrid. I, I wasn't sure if you wanted to bring that up, but uh, I believe you, <laughs> you set a sofa on fire. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. And by, by the time the fire brigade came, everything was put out because we did have fire extinguishers and I took one fire extinguisher and I ran into the building, into my space, held my breath, used the fire extinguisher, ran out again, took another deep breath, went in again and used the fire extinguisher. And, but somehow you're on automatic when something like that happened. Uh, I was anyway. I turned everything off. We had gas fires in the in those days. I turned them off. I moved everything away from the partition wall, so the the wall wouldn't go on, uh, wouldn't be on fire. Yes, but my space was black. Yes. 
was that after the 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 um the sculptural works you were making that you were using so it to, was after it was after that's yes yeah was the, was the when did that happen was that kind of late one evening or was it during the day when it was no like, it was during the during the day i had a therapist session in the morning and i think i was quite i was quite emotional and i came to the studio and i heated up um turbs and wax and it fell over it spilled onto the sofa and it caught fire but it and my shoes burned <laughs> what the shoes you were wearing no <laughs> no <laughs> the shoes that were next to the sofa uh, were they your kind of uh, your your good shoes for outdoors as opposed to the studio they were my good shoes they were Doc Martens yes <laughs> And did you get into much trouble from the studio manager of the day? Absolutely not. But eventually we were not allowed to have those gas fires anymore because not because of a fire like that, but the danger of an explosion. And what has um, Chisholm Hill Art Place meant to you over the past four decades, Ingrid? Well, somehow it's my identity. And um, when you are having a studio space for such a long time, initially it was just wonderful to have a secure space that didn't cost the earth. I could afford it. And I thought, well, I'm selling work, I'm showing work, and it's always going to be like that. And I can afford a big space. But... It's got, and we never ever realized that, of course, none of us realized that rents would go up because we had a very fantastic watertight lease with the council. The council owned the, the whole building and we had a lease where the council could not increase the rent above a certain percentage. But of course, now the lease has that kind of that kind of concession has been taken out of the lease of the current lease, and now the lease lease just goes up every so often, and people can't afford. Eventually, will not. I don't know unless, of course, they're very successful. That's why a lot of people have to do teaching, because of course, as an artist, very often you cannot live by. Uh, selling your work, you have to do other things like teaching. Most of the time in those days, you could just get a teaching job. I used to do three days teaching and or two days teaching and and the rest of the time was in the studio and that was my life, this obsession with making something. Do you mind if I ask you, because you've, you've got the studio in Gisenhau, um, but I believe you also have a studio in in Germany, in Berlin. Is that correct? I did have a studio in Berlin. I now don't have a studio in Berlin. I have I have made work in Germany as well, which I now store in the place I live in, <laughs> Berlin. I now make impermanent work, either all or videos. But I make work that. Um, I make installations with a group of other artists there. And when every year we make work in spaces that are used to be industrial spaces, but are derelict at the moment. And they're in East, in the East part of Germany. And we are a group of women of about 20 artists. And we, we also have guest artists from different countries. And we all work together for about two weeks, but there is a, always a small group of people that have to work a year beforehand because you have to find the space, you have to, you have to get everybody together to look at the space, you have to make applications for funding because of course all that costs money. And then while, the work is undertaken, the artists have to live somewhere. And then when the work is, is done, there is an exhibition, there is a small catalogue, there is a 
bigger catalog at the end. Uh, there is an opening on three weekends, and then everything is taken down, including all the work. And most of the work has been done of um, material that can be discarded. I'm just trying to imagine what it would be like to split one's practice equally or across two different physical locations and two different physical studios and two different physical countries. What was that like, having two studios in two different cities and making work in that way? Well, I started um, being more involved with, with art in Germany after, uh, after the wall came down. And it was a kind of symbolic, it was a bit symbolic also for my own situation. Being German, having come to this country in the 60s and having studied here. And I always say Britain was good to me. I could study here. I don't think I could have studied in Germany. So it was important to be here as well. And I wanted to find out what it was, what it would be like to be also in Germany. The only place I could imagine being was in Berlin. And did you divide your time equally or did you spend summers in Berlin and winters in, in London? No, I, I went back and forth a lot and I spent more time in London. I spent about a week every month. In the end, because also my mother was still alive and I wanted to see her a lot, um, I spent one week a month in Berlin uh, on a regular basis for about five years. But now, of course, uh, during COVID, I'm here. And just before we finish, uh, Ingrid, I'm just wondering, from every I've spoken to who was involved in the studios at the outset or who became involved in the studios like not that long after it had been set up, um, everybody speaks of this sense of communal effort and a community. And yeah, I was just wondering if you could maybe shed some light on that aspect of things back in 1980 and 81, 82. Well, because we more or less all came from the Butler's Wharf Studios and searched for a studio where we then all could go to. We were already a community, but what really fused us was the work we did together. When you do work together, when you do, and it, it was building work and exhibitions, uh, when you do that together, you've become much more uh, a community. And once that finished, we still had, there, there, was, still, there was still maintenance work to do, or it was um, like now the AAC. I mean, the, 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 the small group, about 50, we are 15 now, are we on the AAC? Uh, yeah, between, yeah, I'd say about 13, 14 or 15. It's kind of very... Yes because we know each other and we we talk to each other in meetings it's a more it's it has more a group like feeling and also the people who run workshops in the education space so as soon as you do something together you 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 have that cohesion yes well thanks very much Ingrid. thanks thank you very much for your time and for um, illuminating those images for us <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs>